Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 131, and I spoke with the wonderful Christina Zanato. She, it was when I was in Los Angeles, and she's actually in the Bahamas, so we did the episode over Skype, which I know you guys can always tell when the sound is over the internet instead of uh, in person, but you do what you can with what you got. Uh, I learned of Christina because my friend Jen sent me a video of her, uh, of Christina underwater in full scuba gear, uh, hanging out with tiger sharks. And I was like, who is this woman? This is so cool. So I reached out to Christina and she graciously uh, said yes to a conversation. And it was super cool. <laughs> Christina is a free diver, she's a scuba diver, a cave explorer, uh, and, and when I say a cave explorer, I mean like underwater caves, world-renowned shark researcher, and a conservationist. Um, she speaks five languages, uh, she's, she's a smart cookie, uh, very cool, very cool conversation. I learned a lot. I was astounded by some of the things that she has done. I can't wait for you to hear about her. And of course, because there's so much about what she does, I put a lot of links uh, on heyhumanpodcast.com on the links page. Definitely check out the videos. So freaking cool. Um, yeah, so that was really exciting. As I mentioned, uh, I was in Los Angeles and Christina was in the Bahamas when we had this conversation. And a few days after I left Los Angeles, uh, it caught on fire and has been raging out of control ever since. Devastating. It's so sad. People have lost lives and their homes and animals, and it's just, it's terrible. Um, there are ways to help. I just wanted to mention this while I have everyone's attention. Um, you can do support LAFD.org. So support, it stands for, of course, Los Angeles Fire Department. So support LAFD.org. You can help uh, by uh, American Red Cross, which is redcross.org, and also LA Animal Services if you want to help the furry friends and things. So lots of ways to help. You can always Google um, as well, but it's important that we help each other. And I mean, as long as we're at it, uh, Puerto Rico still needs help too, so there's that. Uh, in other news, of course, the social media stuff, Hey Human Podcast, Instagram, Facebook, uh, you can reach me, Susan, at heyhumanpodcast.com. I have my own Instagram and Twitter and Facebook under Susan Ruthism. Happy to interact with you there. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes. It helps push the algorithm. As we all know, the world is run by robots. <laughs> and uh, also, it's getting to be that time of year, and everyone goes to Amazon and does their shopping. So if you do do that... Please go to heyhumanpodcast.com and on that main homepage, you'll see an Amazon portal link. If you click on that and you shop Amazon as you normally would, uh, a little bit of your purchase helps go back toward Hey Human Podcast, which is really cool. So um, if you think of it and you're going to be shopping Amazon anyway, please use the Amazon portal on the website of Hey Human. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. Well, um... I guess that's about it. Uh, go out there and love on each other and be there for each other and keep going. Keep going. All right, let's uh, let's talk about some sharks. Here we go. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you see me? I can see you. Coming up. There you go. I'm at my Airbnb, so I had to make a makeshift studio. <laughs> Because I'm visiting, uh, I'm in L.A. right now doing interviews. Right. So, uh, pardon the weird makeshift thing behind me. Look at all your you? books. I'm well, how are you? Um, pretty good. It's been a busy day. Yeah. It's a day off, but it was dedicated on tackling a lot of messages and emails and requests and interviews. And I think I've done a third of what I was planning on doing, but better than nothing. There's no such thing as a day off, I think. <laughs> uh, no, no. No, no, right now. <laughs> well, thank you for being on Hey Human. I really appreciate it. 
How did you come up with this idea? Of Hey Human? Yeah. Uh, well, I was starting to lose faith in humanity and I didn't want to do that. So I thought the best way to combat my hopelessness was to try and connect human beings all over about all the things that motivate us and move us and make us feel good about being on the planet. And in doing that, I was hoping that perhaps I would bring us all together. Yeah, I, mean, I, I always complain that the news should actually have a section about good news. I agree. Good deeds, uh, things that people do for each other. I mean, they always love drama, but I hate. I don't watch TV and I don't watch the news, but it would be people should have a, a good deed section in the news. I agree. You know, these people founded this society, and this helped this person, and this policeman helped this guy, and this guy helped this old lady. I mean, they should have all of that. It is an unfortunate reality that good news doesn't sell copies of newspapers because there's something strange about humans that I think we uh, we feast on the... Carcasses. Yes. Or scavengers. You're not, obviously. <laughs> No, I try to surround myself, like I like to look at good stories. When people send me things about dead sharks or anything like that, I tell them, absolutely not. Mm. And I'm a firm believer in you need to send out, like you could do two things. You can s show pictures of dead sharks and fin sharks, and it has a certain impact and an emotional response. But you can also send pictures of a healthy reef with beautiful sharks and good swimming sharks and inspire people to want to protect that. Yeah, I think so, that's a sure much it's... healthier way to look at it. If you show the good and how to keep the good going, people have some, something more to live for. There's a there's a true, again, I was on the, that verge of hopelessness a couple of years ago, just thinking, there's no way. What is going on? Everybody's in such a terrible place. And I thought, well, I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of the thing that makes people see the love, you know, and see yeah. each other, so... So where are you from? Originally, I was born in Seattle. Oh, nice. Yeah. Besides the rain, I, I would love to. I, I would love to visit the entire West Coast. It's just the rain is a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's really beautiful there. And the, the lovely thing about Washington State is that uh, you could drive a couple hours in any direction and you get a rainforest, an ocean, a lake, a river, a mountain, a valley, yeah. a desert. Wow. That's extraordinary. That? Pardon? Where do you live now? I live in Nashville, Tennessee. You say you're in LA doing interviews, so is that your job or? Well, um, the podcast, interviews for the podcast. So I try and travel around and talk to people outside of where I am because otherwise it would just be a show about Nashville. So for me, well, I, I like to talk to people from all over the world and, and hence, you know, someone like you. Somebody actually, my friend Jen, sent me a video um, of you and it was um, of you removing hooks out of sharks. And I said, yes. oh my gosh, who is this woman? This is so cool. So that's why I reached out to you because I thought, what a phenomenal, what a yeah. phenomenal person that, that, that you, because everybody, sharks, let's go to the beginning. Sharks get a really bad rap, right? Mm -hmm. People love to be afraid of sharks. And yet there were images of you petting them on the, on the face and rubbing their bellies and what seemed to me, and I don't know if this was actually what was happening, but in the interpretation of what the narrator of the video I watched was saying, you helped one shark with a hook, and then suddenly now all his little shark friends have been coming up to you saying, hey, could you help me too, which I found really cool. Yes, no, the narrator was me. It was me talking. Oh, it was you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was me. Uh, so it, it so the story the story is it, it, the funny part is I've been doing this way before the internet was born and everybody was like oh wow it's like no I've, I've been removing hooks since you know the nineties but obviously there was no internet out there to broadcast it yeah. um, so what happened is that that one shark that I removed specifically when I went in she didn't like to be pet but after I removed two hooks, one on Monday, one on Thursday, which I didn't tell in the story, but the second one on Thursday is when I went in, all of a sudden she became the shark that likes to be pet the most. She's is very imprinted. The other story that overlaps is sometimes when I go to remove hooks, when I start attempting, uh, because I do recognize my sharks. My sharks, I do recognize who is who, where they come, blah, blah, blah. So sometimes I'm removing hooks, and all of a sudden there's this shark swimming by with a hook, that I'm like, i never seen that shark before. And it, it seems it just 
it's too much of a coincidence to happen so many times that as I start removing hooks from my known sharks, other sharks with hooks that I do not recognize, all of a sudden they're swimming by. And maybe they don't really come in because that there's just so much of a process to remove a hook. And I've, I've been receiving hundreds of emails. That, oh, when I come there and do that, and it says you, you don't understand. I mean, you need to work with sharks. Uh, some sharks may require weeks to remove a hook. Some sharks don't like to be touched. Some sharks, it can be dangerous. It's not that you just come down and go, oh, here's the hook, and off it comes. And so sometimes there's a process of weeks just for the sharks to say, Last time I ate something that smelled and felt like that, it hurt. And now you want me to do the same thing. And I could, you know, I know I give them almost a human interpretation, but I can tell they sit there going, yeah, I don't think so. And there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a place where the, you can tell the shark is saying, nature is telling me, hey, go and get that fish. That's what nature is requiring the shark to do. The fish is dead. You need to get it. It's available. But the other one is like, yeah, but the last time I did that, it really hurt. So then you have to gain their trust again. And so sometimes just to get the shark with a hook that shows up to, to come close enough so that I can remove a hook, it's just I have to feed, feed, and agitate the sharks. And that's the other funny part, right? Because everybody expects you going in the water and you have fish and the sharks will just like, Wah! or I put them in front of their nose and I'm like, oh, no, that hurts. And they don't even want to eat it. So there's a long process that is kind of hard to convey through a short story, but it it is a build up, it is a relationship, and it is a lot of failed attempts, a lot of failed attempts. And so first you have to convince the shark to eat. Then once he eats, you have to make sure that it doesn't hurt, because if it's a fresh, fresh hook that hurts, and you hurt too much, it's going to run away and not come back for a few days. Then you need to convince the shark, and then when they finally realize that you're trying to remove the hook. Then they do this, we do the, I call it the dance, right? It's just like you try to remove the hook and the pain, animals do not understand pain towards a better feeling. So if you go to the dentist, right? Or if you cut yourself, I have plenty of stitches because I'm clumsy. When I go to the hospital and I stick the needle to stitch my cuts because I hit things that appear out of the blue, then maybe the needle burns, but I know that's going to be better because a stitch is going to help my cut. Well, an animal is not, is not if, they, if it hurts, they'll go, ah, <laughs> I don't think so. So the shark comes in, I try to remove the hook, and the shark goes, ah, I don't think so. But then they keep coming back and back and back. And you, I can't really say, because I can't talk for the sharks, but you can't tell me that that's a normal behavior. That is a behavior of an animal that has made a connection. I don't know at what level because I'm not in their brains. But you can't tell me that I tried to remove the hook and it hurts and the shark swims away and comes back in. Swims away and comes back in. And I guarantee you, yes, there's a food. But when we start that dance, I don't even need to feed them anymore. They just have this routine. And then sometimes you try, 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 and then they'll go, yeah, this hurts, and they'll disappear. And then they'll come back maybe the next dive or the next day or something. Well, it seems very coincidental that sharks you've never met before come out of the blue and say hey it makes in my brain I imagine the sharks that you've helped go off and say hey Phil there's a lady over there that'll take your hook out for you or it's a vibe I mean they have seven sensors sensory system not five like we do what's their, is it something what's their two extra they have a lateral line that allows them to see images through water movement, right? So it's a pore with like a hair like ours. And if the water hits them, the hair moves and sends an imagery to their brain. Son. And they have an extrasensory system on their nose called ampullae of Lorenzini. And they can feel electromagnetic field sensors. So they can feel, for example, vibration for brains. Uh, they're extremely attracted to the strobes of like photographers when the strobes go and recharges they're attracted to the uh, the waves emitted by like research machines they're attracted for example to metal things that's the reason why you find great whites trying to bright propellers of water of boats in the water because it emit these little things and they feel they have this enormous sensory system right in front of their face and they feel electromagnetic fields so uh, there's a theories about why the hammerheads 
travel in certain groups in certain ways and they they say they can feel almost the magna magma moving underground wow they are, so are they one of the oldest that. creatures on the planet are they not uh oldest living i guess there's some i can vouch i mean they're 400 some of them are 400 million years old um there's now the greenland shark they're saying that some of them could be up to 300 years old but it hasn't been three to four hundred years old but it hasn't been really you have to kill one and analyze it <laughs> uh you know the spine or whatever so uh, let's kill a four a almost 400 year old animal to figure it out if it's 400 so scientists are now doing that um i don't know if it's the oldest creature because i mean there's also the komodo dragons and tortoises and stuff like that they've been around They're, a long time found, remember they found the celiocant mm -hmm. right the, the fish with feet mm-hmm so they found the celio count in South Africa. So, but yeah, we are up there with the, some of the oldest. We could say some of the oldest creatures on this planet, absolutely. So you began this journey, really, your fascination, you were quite young. And you learned yes. how to dive. When did you connect the dots of, was it always, I'm going to learn how to dive so that I can look at sharks? Or did they? No. So I am the daughter of... Uh, an ocean family. Both my mom and dad come from the water, but at two very different levels. So my dad was, I'm pretty sure, I mean, the story's been out of quite a while, but my dad was a military diver. And so I grew up with these unique pictures of him in his uh, unique uh, suit. And, uh, so this is what I grew up with. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. So military diver, and I was just, uh, and but with a healthy relationship with the ocean, that was the the thing that both my mom and dad taught me was uh, uh, the ocean is uh, very useful. We also, if I'm from the Mediterranean, so we outsource our food. We need to respect it, and sharks are just sharks. I mean, in my family, just gonna like when I was like, oh, sharks as a kid, they were like, sharks is just a fish, blah blah. You just need to understand the fish, and that was their attitude. Um, my fascination for sharks came from a silly movie. I fell in love with the idea of having sharks for friends because this guy could actually swim with sharks. He had a medallion or something, but uh, pretty sure it was a pretty crappy movie at the time. But for me, it was fascinating that somebody could actually befriend the most feared animal, right? So that was my childhood dream. I knew I could not be a ballerina. So, because I had too many stitches, I already hit too many corners. So, <laughs> um, I was like, swimming, ocean, sharks. Uh, the scuba diving came at a later age. Um, I got certified at 22 because my dad, the same man that inspired me and always took me to the ocean, uh, didn't want me to become a scuba diver because he had experienced a scuba diving environment that was extremely dangerous. 1957, 1960, 1965. Scuba diving hasn't even born for recreational divers yet. Jacques Cousteau came after that. So he was a military diver, and scuba diving was dangerous, extremely dangerous. That was back when they had those crazy big glass hats, right? No, no, he was on an oxygen rebreather with a mask and everything, so he did missions and stuff like that. And it, was that more free diving kind of stuff? I mean, that outfit, it no, looks... No, he was on scuba. He oh, was okay. like he was breathing on... out of the water, but what he did was extremely dangerous. Yeah. So he remained with the concept that scuba diving was for military, hardcore people. So when I was like, oh, I want to become a scuba diver, I was kind of like, oh, it's a dangerous sport. It was the only thing, you know, that maybe I... With my dad in the beginning, it was just kind of, it's just for the manly men. Yes. <laughs> but that was the mentality where he grew up with. And so I had the opportunity to become a scuba diver l later in life. I, I see now, like I worked, I, I have a lot of mentorees that I brought up through the years. And some of them started, I've had kids that are now young adults in their 26, 27, that I start diving and teaching them when they're 11, 12, 13, right? I started at 22, so technically kind of like late mm -hmm. compared to what's available to the younger generations nowadays. And so I came here on vacation. It was a, a random pick of a destination because there was nothing else available. I had a list. I went to a travel agency, and I had vacation. I'm like, right, I, I want to become a scuba diver. I want to go here. And they're like, yeah, not available. I want to go here. And they're like, mm, no, Ramadan. It's like, oh, I want to go here. Mm, it's closed. I want to go. Ooh, that's too expensive. And so at the bottom of this list 
was their proposal to come here in the Bahamas. It was a discounted rate because it was off season because it was a little bit cooler. And it was a honeymoon destination. And so it was an empty spot on the plane. <laughs> Somebody did not have their wedding, I guess. <laughs> I guess. So I get this full of discounted trip in an all-inclusive resort, which is totally different than how I like to do my vacations. But I came here, learned to scuba dive, and I was like, okay, and the next. And they're like, well, you know, you go home and go back to your real job and take the next vacation and go scuba diving again. And in that series of coincidences came a series of choices. And that's what I also tell people when they go, oh, I want your life. And it's just like, can't have it. It's mine. And, and I'm not saying this in a, a mean way, but it's mine. It's not yours to have. Right. Um, it was a series of coincidences and a series of choices uh, that I took. So the coincidence was that the five destinations I picked to go to become scuba diver were not available. The sixth one was proposed by the travel agency. The other coincidence was that uh, when I got here, I was one of the few single people on the entire airplane. And so I was hung always hanging around with the staff, with the crew in the resort. And then the other coincidence is that I speak five languages and I was working for a hotel and the vacation I was on, we're looking for someone to take place at the front desk to speak those languages to work for the hotel. The choice was that in 12 days, I finished my vacation, I went home, I quit my job, I left my boyfriend, I packed my stuff in boxes, I gave the car to my parents, and I said, I'm gone. That's amazing, I love it. So that's when I tell people, it's like, that option, that choice, that specific one is not there, there's plenty more, there's plenty more, there's one that has just happened very recently, to... Uh, a crew of mine, it was the same kind of concept. It was a series of coincidences where he decided to do a course and then he decided to do it somewhere else. And then he took a different course from me. And then I was just like, hey, why don't you try and stay and see if you like it here? And then he stayed and then he got really along well with the team. And so at a certain point, we're like, oh, we need to hire someone. I was like, I know who to hire. But then he took the choice of saying, Okay, I'm going to leave everything. First of all, he took the choice of saying, you know what, I'm going to give it a try for a month. Nothing guaranteed. Right? It's like you, you got to stay here and nothing is guaranteed, but why don't you stay? And the first choice is, yes, I'm going to stay and try this one out. No guarantees. There's, there was nothing beyond that month. And that is the other thing I tell people. You know, They expect to see, like, show me the way. Woo! And that is the result. And it's just like, you might not even see past this week. But you have to make that choice. So the choice was made. The opportunity was given. Right. And then the next one was, here's your next choice. Take it or leave it. And that's the other one. Are you going to take it? Or are you going to leave it? And so it's a series. It. Life is a series of coincidences. Some of them you create yourself. Some of them just accumulate at the right time. But ultimately, is your choices. What choice are you going to make? Which door would you walk through? Or am I going to go back to my job in Italy that would allow me to grow into the hotel industry and have this beautiful hotel director job with, you know, four or five star hotels in the center of a historical city of Italy? Or am I going to go to the Bahamas and drop everything and shop with a duffel bag? And that's all I had to my name. Nothing was guaranteed. Nothing is ever guaranteed. But one would have been a more reasonable choice in people's mind than the other one. Ah, reason is overrated. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, but, I mean, for years I had to listen to the, oh, what about your education? You threw away blah. And, and it was, you know, just like a, you threw away something. And it's just kind of like, yeah, but I gained so much more. Yeah. But nobody could tell me then what I would gain. Do you, do you remember the first experience with a shark? The very, very first one? The very, very, well, there's two, right? There's the first time I went in the water and I watched somebody else with the sharks. And I was just like, <gasps> they have sharks here. And there was Ben Rose, who's my mentor. 
and he was diving with sharks. He already created a little bit of a shark dive. But my first personal one was uh, now and forever. It was the first time a shark fell asleep in my lap. So I tried. I was being trained by my mentor, Ben Rose, who then left me the entire program to do. But he was standing there, and I was just so desperate to try to put the shark to sleep because I'd seen him doing it. And I was like, I want to do the same thing. And so I was trying, and at a certain point, I was like, oh, this is no, not going to happen. And she came in and just laid on my lap. And so um, sharks, when they stop swimming, naturally sink down to the ocean floor. They sink. And so I nailed down with her, and I had her right on my thighs. And what they do is most species of sharks can ventilate in the water by moving their jaws, and they pump water through their gills with a system called buccal pumping. And I was sitting there, and I could feel her jaw, their bottom jaw opening and closing. I can feel a little bit of her weight on her thighs. And I remember I looked up, and ben, Uncle Ben, because we call him Uncle Ben, we were standing there going, <laughs> you did first, first and forever to this day it's the most amazing experience is when the shark just surrenders because it's a full surrender into your lap and you can feel them ventilate and you can feel them their weight i think that is the best experience so does it, does it feel like to you that they understand that you're trying to learn about them i think of any creature that has a DNA profile that is so old, even though they are, you know, a wild creature and that they, they are ruled by whatever rules them, there's still that thing passes between living creatures. I think the what passes between us is I'm not a threat and I'm not a stress and I'm not a source of a run away because most most people think oh the sharks is going to have a fight reaction but most animals have, have a flight reaction right um, and that's dictated by nature very few animals will turn around and fight because there's always a risk of getting hurt so the shark primary reaction to any threat stress or pain is flight and they'll They'll flee. So I think that when I come in, uh, and now there is a repetition, there's what I call an imprinting. We have created a relationship. But in the beginning, it was a lack of stress and a lack of threat and a lack of pain. So that is what allowed the boundaries to close. Plus, it was a reward, right? The reward is the fish. Yes. I was talking with somebody else, you know, everybody's like, oh, you feed the sharks, it's not love, it's not relationship, and it's just kind of like, I also tri give a treat to my dogs when they sit, right? Yeah. And two of, three of them sit, and two of them could, can do the down, and the third one cannot even do the down. So if I have such a close animal to my, to, to my life, I still have to give a treat, it could be a positive reinforcement. It could be like, oh, you're such a good puppy. Oh, you're so good. You know, oh, whistle, whatever, clicker. I mean, it's all things that we train the, the animals, but even the humans with. If you study, I'll give you an A. Right. If you do well at your dance performance, when you leave classroom, I'll put a little star sticker on your forehead. And if you pass your exams or your interview, you actually get an awesome job. So there is a reward system no matter where you are. So they naturally know you're not a snack. They understand that. Well, so, so here's, that is the traditional under, uh, concept, right? Every time somebody thinks sharks, they're like, oh, they're going to eat you. It's like, no. First of all, there's 502 species of sharks. The smallest one in the world fits in the palm of my hand. It is basically... This size, size the size of a pen. Yeah. Put a pen in your hand and look down and you're looking at the smallest shark in the world, right? And then walk out of your apartment, look at the bus that is carrying the children to school and you're looking at the biggest shark in the world. In between, there's all these animals, all these sharks that uh, eat conch or lobsters or plankton or other little fishes or little sardines and all of that. And very few, very few, when they encounter humans, if they encounter humans, there is an impossible risk of a damage to humans. So sharks do know that humans are not a snack. If a shark could always identify a human as a human, they'll go, that is not a snack. 
is when the shark sometimes can tell that a human is a human, that it might be a possibly the shark goes, oh, that looks like my normal snack. It's like, oh, it wasn't. Uh, so it's in a human's job to understand which shark in which conditions. And the, if you think about the millions of people that go in the water and the amount of sharks that are in the water, the encounters that happen that humans don't know are thousands. If humans just knew how many thousands of times sharks swim under them, by them, next to them, go up and inspect them and do realize like, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. And then sometimes there's that one unfortunate encounter. But we need to understand what triggers that encounter, that negative encounter. But we can just focus on that. And that, I think, is the biggest mistake we do. When we hear sharks, we need to start hearing, and I keep saying that, it's like saying birds. If I said all birds are black, your reaction would be? Crazy. Absolutely yeah. not. I mean, there's macaws and sure. birds of paradise and, right. you know, peacocks and... And if I said all birds can sing beautifully, you'd be like, mm, I don't think so. <laughs> Have you ever heard a crow? Right? Um, and if I said all birds even fly, uh, no. no. Emus and ecru and, and ostriches and penguins don't fly. And I can keep going, all birds nest in the trees. And it's like, no, they don't. Right? And, and it goes and goes and goes. So... It's the same thing with sharks. When we hear sharks, all we actually imagine is, most of us imagine a great white, a bull shark, two or three, four, five, ten species that we know of. There's 502. And there are sharks that I can show you an image. If we were not talking about shark and I said, what is this? You'd be looking at that going, hmm, is that an eel? Or is that a fish? You wouldn't even be able to identify with a shark shape. Interesting. Right, so... There's even sharks that are even shark shaped. I call Caribbean. I call most of the uh, carcarinos sharks the shark shaped shark, which is the traditional pectoral fins, the tail, the pelvic fins, the dorsal fin. There's sharks that don't even look like sharks. There's sharks that look like eels. Yeah. When you were talking about the shark falling asleep in your lap, I read about you doing the the is it tonic immobility? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Is that what that was, or yeah. is that something different? So tonic immobility is a natural reaction of animals, not only sharks, to situation of stress or threat. And the tonic immobility actually immobilizes the animal to the point of no reaction. So I used to call it erroneously tonic immobility because that's what, oh, you're doing tonic immobility. But as I started looking into it, I was like, wait a minute, when the shark is asleep in my lap, she can still see, so her eyes are still Hello? Oh, I'm here. I don't know what happened just then. Keep okay. going. Sorry. Okay. As long as my connection has been terrible today. Their eyes are still moving. If too many people come too close, she'll wake up and swim away. So she's still alert and she's still capable of recognizing what's going on or not. So to me, that is actually a lesser level than tonic immobility. And it's still a responsive level. So... Because it's responsive, and I'm saying responsive because the moment she decides she's done, she's done. She's like a cat. <laughs> like a cat. Yeah, people go, oh, your sharks are like dogs. I'm like, no, they're like a cat. If they want to come in, they'll come in. If they don't want to come in, they're not going to come in. I guarantee you that. <laughs> but like a cat, she'll wake up and swim away. In tonic immobility, the animal is hopeless is at the mercy of the animal or the person that's put it into tonic. So there's sharks that have been put into tonic for surgery. Like there's Dr. Gruber, Samuel Gruber at Bimini Shark Lab can put tigers in. They hook them, rope them, flip them. The sharks takes a while to go into tonic and then they can actually make incision and put in satellite tag and stitch them. I could never ever do that with my shark. I'd be like, gone. So that's the reason why I moved away from the word tonic immobility because there's not an element of stress or threat. And there's a, a level of alertness that to me makes a shark almost choosing to want to be there. Mm-hmm. As they choose to be there and sometimes they choose not to be there. So there might be dives where it's just like, yeah, the sharks were uncomfortable, something had disturbed them. Uh, for example, when hurricanes are coming, mm. 
mm-hmm. it's very hard to large to to have a shark that wants to relax. If a shark, if a hurricane is three to four days away, the sharks are very like. I don't think I want to sit here with you right now. There's something big coming, and they can feel it through the water. I, I do, I do, I do believe they feel it. Like you know, a day before the hurricane hits, the calm before the storm. Yeah, the birds are quiet. Right. Yeah. The lizards are gone. Yeah, they know. Everybody's gone. Is like eerie silent and it's true it's a silence before the storm yeah the creatures that are one with the earth know it better than those like the humans yes. who are, who are just... look there's the security videos that show the dog running away yeah 10 to 30 seconds before the earthquake uh, earthquake hit, hit, hits yeah they know like the security cameras you see the dog and he's sleeping and you see the dog running and then the camera is empty and then the earth okay, happens. Yeah. happens. I, I, I caught something you said. They flip the shark over and that's that sends it into this place? Or is it more complicated? Yeah, so the flipping, the, the restraining the animal and the forceful flipping is what put an animal, the shark, into tonic immobility. Mm-hmm. And I've done it before only with, like, small nerd shark. So, like, we had a nerd shark that had uh, a hook that needed to be removed and I remember, but she was still small, and I actually grabbed her pectorofin like a male would do during mating, and I flipped her over, and when she went backwards, she went into tiny, I was able to remove the hook. Um, that was like one of the few times that I was actually able to put in true tonic immobility. But imagine an eight-foot shark. I would never be able to flip or force. I can't force an eight-foot animal whose element is the water into something, nothing. Right. Not standing there in my clad chainmail, cumbersome tank, and I move into matrix system. You know, trying to do something. The animal's like, so I do believe it's not forceful. Because I can't force an animal that size to do anything. It's it's so interesting to hear you say chainmail. I think, okay, let's see, I'm going to get in the water and I'm going to cover myself in a heavy metal suit <laughs> that seems so crazy. I mean, I get it. It's to keep, it's for biting, right? And just in case. Okay, so you're cooking a cake. You open the oven. You want to check the check that the cake is cooking, and you need to stick your toothpick through your cake. What do you put on your hand to grab the pan? The hot, hot hands. That's what we call it. A hot hand, a mitten, right? Yeah. It's the same concept. Would you grab the hot pan without the mitten? Nope. No. So when I go and work with sharks and there's food involved, it's the same hot mitten. I put shame on in the unlikely event. Mitten. And especially when removing hooks, I mean, I just get grazed, you know, I, I'm by their mouth. So, um, you know, I could get cut. But it's simple as that. It's like wearing a helmet to go climbing. And people, again, I get this, I get quite a lot of messages, a lot of very good messages. And then there's a part of the negative messages, the people that see the negativity and everything that everybody else do, does. And the thing is, oh, if the sharks were so nice and the sharks were so friendly, if the sharks really loved you, which is none of the things I ever say. I don't say sharks love me. I love sharks. But if the sharks were like that, you wouldn't need the chain mail. And it's just like, um, the chain mail is not there because the sharks has an intention of biting me or whatever, it's not malicious nor vicious, is simply in the likely event. So I wear a harness to go mountain climbing in case I slip and fall, not because I plan to launch myself off the cliff. Yes. Right? Um, you wear a helmet going horseback riding. Right. You the, the horse does not intentionally, well, <laughs> intent uh the horse technically does not intention knock you off yeah every once in a while the horse might (laughs) exactly there is an intent because there's also i see you have all your fingers and arms and things so have you ever been have you ever been hurt yes many times oh okay i get bitten on the regular basis especially because i work um a lot with people so i communicate a lot so i just move my hand as the thing is going on and the shark will just come by and and bite. Um, 
but you get bitten because I, I'm hanging onto the fish in my hand and here's a shark's mouth and if I don't move it or if I make a little mistake, I could get uh, grazed or scratched. But I can go dives, hundreds of dives without ever even getting bitten or anything. To be honest with you, I get bumped more than bitten. They do these weird things. As I, I look at them and I, I think they're so cute. Adorable. Like they'll swim. And they, you know, they're supposed to be these machines, and then they'll swim and they'll go into each other like, it's like, well, you guys didn't see, feel, you know, seven senses, but they'll bump into each other. So as they'll bump into each other, sometimes they'll swim and they'll go and bump into you. And it's so silly. Uh, it's just like they, I don't know, I don't know what it is, uh, but I've been bumped more than I've been bitten, and most of the bites is just like you know, like I had the fish. And I move the hand, and the shark thinks I still have the fish, and I'll come and bite the, the hand. But I've done, I do dives where I'll feed, and then I'll put the feeder tube down. And on, while staying on the water, I'll take the suit off and leave it there next to my feeder tube and go swimming mm-hmm. and scuba diving. Mm-hmm. And the sharks know exactly that I have no more food and nothing else to offer. And, and they don't care. It's a, it's. There's a lot of myths going around sharks, and one is, you know, if you feed them, they'll eat people when you don't have food, and it's like, that's not so true. Or you'll end up like the grizzly man. Well, thank goodness I don't work with grizzlies, I work with sharks, so <laughs> sharks don't behave like grizzlies. And so, no, I'm not going to end up like the grizzly man because I'm working with a totally different... No, if I did it with grizzlies, chances are I may end up with like the grizzly man, but... Yeah. Um, when sharks mate... Do they, yes. do they, um, are they being really selective over their partner? Like the females, do they go, oh, that's Mr. Strong Shark over there is better than Mr. Book Smart Shark over there? I mean, how do they pick out who they, they want? Are. So female pick. So in many species, usually the male fight and the winner gets the female. Or, you know, they'll show their peacock tail and then the female goes, oh, I like that peacock tail better than yours. And this usually has to do with size and strength. Uh, the mating of the sharks is in another anthropomorphic interpretation where people look at sharks mating and they're like, oh, it's so violent and so aggressive because the, the female will uh, resist the attempts of the male to mate. And if the male can't convince her through his strength to mate, that means he's not strong enough. But to uh, people, when they watch, it's like, oh, the male forced the female. It's like, no, no, no. She's testing. She's resisting. And she's testing the strength of the male. And when the male comes along that has enough strength to overcome her, then she'll go and mate. So she picks through resistance and uh, basically tag of war. Because she wants the strongest babies. She wants the strongest babies. So they mate with different male they can actually hold on to the sperm. And I'm, we, again, we're generalizing, but in general, sharks can hold on to the sperm of males for up to a year sometimes. There's pieces of sharks that actually have held on to um, sperm and then they get maybe captured to be put in an aquarium. And then in the aquarium, all of a sudden, there's like eggs coming out or pups coming out. And it's just like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, they also do mate with several males and can actually hold on to the different sperms. Interesting. Yeah, so it's a very unique world. But when the male grabs the female, it uses his mouth. So for depending on the species, like my species, my sharks have teeth. So when the females come back from the mating season, they have these giant gashes and bite marks and chunks even of flesh missing, which is brings up two things. One, they're absolutely remarkable because we, between two to three weeks, they're almost healed insane but the other one is people go oh that was so vicious it's like no that's not vicious that's how sharks mate it's like looking at my dogs eating out of the food bowl and say oh your dogs have no table manners they should know how to use fork and knife and it's kind of like no it's a dog that's how they eat now if i ate like my dog i will have some concerns about taking me to a restaurant but you can't say the dog has is you know is has no table manners just because it's slurping its food out of the ball. So it's the same thing. You can't say that the mating of the sharks is violent or vicious or is aggressive just because the male grabs the female. That's how nature designed them. Yeah. Are you are you finding it difficult to um to promote 
the conser the conservation of sharks when there is such a a negative the correct words the correct words is it's it's hard to promote the conservation of large carnivorous animals mm. mm hmm you know, it's a, and that's the problem, right? It's kind of like, but we have achieved that with polar bears. And polar bears actually is one of the few animals out there that intently will hunt after humans. Thank you, Coca-Cola. But no, polar bear is one of the most dangerous animals out there on the planet and will actively follow the scent and actively hunt down to eat a human. And yet, we do understand that that is the nature of the polar bear, and we do understand that we need to protect polar bears, and we do understand that the Arctic is melting, and we're losing the polar bears. So there is a chance that maybe we can start making people understand that we need to protect large carnivorous animals. We do understand that for bears. We do understand that for lions. We do understand that for tigers. These are animals that have eaten people out of their own villages in Africa and India and those places. But now we get it. We do understand that going with a kayak down the river in Africa, you do not want to upset a hippo. But we don't go around the world killing hippos just because a hippo is potentially dangerous to you going out with a kayak down the river. You actually try to understand how it works and outsmart the situation. And I think that's the next step we need to do with sharks. But a person have a theory on why the shark is such a vilified animal. Why? And can't because Steven Spielberg. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Steven Spielberg. Let's 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 defend poor Steven Spielberg. <laughs> even and even uh, uh, Peter Benchley. Peter Benchley wrote a novel. He didn't say, hey, by the way, this is a biology book about no. gray whites. He wrote a novel. Right, exactly. It's a fantasy work by Peter Benchley. Good, good for you, Dobbs. He wrote the other one, The Mysteries of the Deep. And, you know, he writes about adventures and all that. Um, Steven Spielberg is the same. He says, I'm going to do a Hollywood movie. By the way, this is a Hollywood movie. Did I mention it's a Hollywood movie? <laughs> Right. <laughs> so whatever people decided to interpret that is their problem. I, I, we need to stop, you know, throwing stones at these two poor guys. I mean, in the end, one was director of movies and the other one is a book writer. Right. right? The problem is that as humans, we're very arrogant and we have conquered every single aspect of our planet. We live in the Arctic. The Inuits live in the Arctic. We live in Greenland. Mm -hmm. We live in the rainforest. We even live in the desert. Mm -hmm. There's Bedouins or there's even the Aboriginal in Australia and in the Kalahari. We have conquered every aspect of our planet, but the oceans. We can live. You can drop me, which, figuratively speaking, but you can drop me with almost nothing in the middle of a snowstorm. And there's a way to survive that. We use ice to warm ourselves up. We, 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 you know, there's a lot of things, and obviously some of it is myth that I heard, but you can carve something in the ice and you can huddle up and mm -hmm. the ice protects from the wind. There's nothing, nothing in the ocean to our advantage. Is, and I call it, I, this is one of the things that I wrote in one of my articles, and I start calling it that the ocean is as alien as the outer space. Without a suit, without a helmet, without all the supplies, the ocean is lethal. Yes, you can do your breath hold and you can do that, but a few hours in the ocean, you'll die of hypothermia no matter where you are. You can be in the Caribbean in 86 degrees water. Within six hours, you'll start shivering. Yeah. There is no oxygen. You can't see. You can't swim. You have nothing in the ocean. You say, I'm going to use that to my advantage. Oh, I'm going to take a breath and huddle underneath a core head and weather the night. No, you can't. You're floating out in the middle of nowhere. And the shark is the apex of the most amazing animal out there. And he has two things. It's just so well designed, seven senses. And it is a predator. And so it becomes, in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, it becomes a culprit He's our scapegoat of our frustration and anger and um, incapability of dominating 75% of our planet. 
Yeah. And it becomes our scapegoat. It reminds her of representation of our anger caused by our frustration because we can't dominate the ocean. No matter how much we think we are, no matter what we build, the submarines, the ships, the even the, the platforms or anything like that, when the ocean rage at a certain level, the ships split in half and sink. The platforms flood. The We haven't been able to manage nor contain, nor dominate the ocean. We've done that everywhere else. It is interesting. I, I, I suppose it's because of their teeth that, you know, whales are the cuddly ones and the sharks are the vilified ones. When, I mean, a, a, a humongous whale can obviously do some damage as well, you know? Bobby Dick is, is it's a story that is born from a true story. And sperm whales used to actually... Uh, with their giant melon with their head, hit the shipping whales because they thought it was like a counterpart enemy. Mm. And they purposely sunk them. Yeah. it's. I think it's because of their teeth. I think their teeth and their predatory capabilities make them the scapegoat. But that's my theory about it. But it's just like, why are we hating sharks so much? What have the poor thing done to us? Well, I run out of a room when I see a spider, and I'm much bigger than it. It's just, it's, it's just in your head, you know, what you can, what you make of an understanding of something. Well, at least you run out, you don't kill a poor thing. You don't eat them because they actually eat insects. So I grew up in the Congo, ah. and we kept spiders around. We kept spiders on the balconies because they eat the mosquitoes that bring the malaria, and the malaria is way higher killer than a spider. So I grew up in a country and in an environment where you want snakes around because they eat the rats. Yes, there's ma green mambas and black mambas, but you want them around because they kill those animals that actually bring more diseases. You kept the chameleons, you kept the spiders, you kept the bats. And so I grew up in an environment where the vilified animals of our more westernized society is just kind of like, oh, heck no, you want that one around your house. Yeah, I love bats. They're one of my most favorite animal or creatures. And I always say it'd be so fun. If you had a pet bat, you'd never get bitten by a mosquito. It'd just fly around <laughs> you and <laughs> snack away. I also a couple of bats in my apartment. Mind you, the guano stinks a lot. Oh, yeah. Well, there's that. But There's that. But, you know, you can actually have them on your windows or something. Yeah, I just, I think bats are awesome. So where's your most favorite place in all the world to dive? Right here. Really? In the Bahamas? You know what? Uh, each place has its unique charm, and each, each place that I visit, and I haven't visited that many because I tend to stay and visit a place and stay and stay and stay. Each one has a unique story mm. and a unique experience. Mm -hmm. um, the reason why I like this one here is because through my life choices, the one that we're talking about, I can be in a cave in the morning and with sharks in the afternoon. I don't have to drive, I don't have to pack, I don't have to do anything. It's all here on my doorsteps. And it's my favorite because it is, it is my, my backyard. It is very familiar. And it still has so many endless possibilities, although I see it every day. There are places, I have dream places, and I, have, I would love to see this, and I would love to do that, and blah, blah, blah. But my favorite place, I have it. I found it. Mm -hmm. I just want now more time to explore it more which I've been lacking lately unfortunately but I just want more of this place yeah now cave exploration is a lot it's a whole nother ball game right uh, totally different. you know what totally different and same mindset but I'm thinking I'm one of the few cave divers that love sharks and one of the few shark divers that absolutely is at that level of cave diving. I mean, there's very few in the world that can do both. You know, most cave divers don't really like sharks and most shark people don't really go cave diving. But on top of that, I'm a cave instructor and a cave explorer. Um, and there's two totally different worlds, but the mindset is the same. And the mindset is not the one of a risk taker. Uh, the mindset is the one of a, uh, uh, um, a solution thinker. And it's a preparation. It's very much a, a detailed-oriented mind in both cases. Uh, I don't go willy-nilly in the ocean with sharks without thinking about 
the what if that's the reason why we're in the chain no that's the reason why i want to go here that's the reason why i don't want to do it here that's the reason why i don't do it with this shark that's the reason why i don't do it at this distance from shore when there's no and i watch people doing certain things with sharks and i'm like i wouldn't even go diving there simply for the fact that if i surface injured from a dive it takes me three days to get back to help mm-hmm. right so we're basically solution thinkers we just go into this this is all the preparation and especially uh the uh cave diving it's an analytical mind so oh, no i'm not a risk taker but the mindset is the same i'm not a risk taker with sharks and i'm not a risk taker with cave diving and i'm not the, a thrill the dives, it's it's the craigs and stuff you have to be really careful of of all that, I suppose. And well, cave diving is, it's that, that is, I mean, that is really launching yourself. If the ocean was, you know, launching yourself in space, cave diving is just going like exploring a totally new planet. I mean, you're underground, underwater. It's craziness. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's exciting and wonderful, but my it's beautiful. Be- it's calming. That's the thing. It's calming. For me, it's like one of the most peaceful places I've ever been. Mm. And will overgo in this planet. It's a history of the planet. You know, it's like a. I imagine every time I go, okay, I just open this giant books. You know, there's full of dust, and it tells you this is how the planet. What are some of the cooler things you may have seen? In uh, cave diving? Yes. Oh my goodness! Um, from like the crystals formations, oh, uh, wow. forest forest of crystals and you couldn't even create i know there's a couple of glass artists in the world that couldn't create what the planet is down there to unique creatures like unique creatures like we have one that was actually discovered here called the remipedia to even how the clay sediments and just like tells the stories how the water flows and how the cave is on different levels and it's a labyrinth of uh, it's of magic proportions. It's just, and it tells you all these stories all at one. And, and sometimes you can dive through it and you can hear how the planet moved and how the planet formed. And, and it's just, if you're willing to listen, you know, it's just kind of, and it's cool because it's, it's the eternal darkness. It's the darkness of a grave, if not more. And you pass through with this light. It's like a whisper. This is a story. And as the light is gone, you leave that part behind. And for me, it's like this, it's it's eternity because when I'm in the ocean in general, but especially in a cave, time does not tick. And so I'm 46 now and I've been cave diving for the last 20 years. And when I'm in the cave, because a cave changes way, way slower than, than an ocean, right? The reef, I can tell it has changed in 20 years for the worse, but it has changed. Uh, the cave doesn't. And so I could be 24 or 26 or 46. I think I was 24 when I became a cave diver. Yeah, so it's 22 years I've been cave diving. When I'm in that cave, it hasn't changed. It's too imperceptible of a change. And so it puts you in this bubble, in this in this undefined timeline. There is a time, you know, there's a time of your decompression, the time of your gas and all of that, obviously. But... The time is encapsulated in what you're doing and what you're seeing, and you cannot afford to think anything else. Right. That's the analytical part. You have to be a couple steps ahead of yourself, I suppose. Right, but you also have to be in the now. And so in our society, it's so difficult to be in the now. And so cave diving is like, it's almost like hitting a cushion. You go, and it's like, okay, now you're here, right here. And you can only be here. And as you go through the cave, you can only be here. You can be here thinking, ooh, a seven and a half dinner. Oh, what time is it? Oh, I have another interview. It's here. And you move through the cave encapsulated in that time. And that for me is one of the most magnificent things about caves. Besides the discovery, it's like really, I mean, going through the universe. Mm. Um, I don't do cave diving because it's dangerous. We cave diving because it has this exploration, this discovery, this... uh, absolutely entering a new universe here's my moon on this planet i don't need to go in space i have it here i've been in tunnels where nobody else has ever been before there's been more people on the moon or in around orbiting around the planet earth than has ever been in some of my caves 
Have you mapped all of these? Is that while you're doing that? Not all of them. Yeah. Not all of them is a lot of work. I'm yeah. still, it's a work in progress. My special cave. So it's extraordinary. You have been, you have touched parts of this planet that no one has, has touched. ever touched. That I mean, it gives me shivers. It's incredible. There was one part of a cave that I actually found, and then. I had to go back the next day because I ran out of line. I was like, ah! <laughs> and there's like this massive room in front of me. I'm like, with a line, you know, I was like, ah, are you serious? So I had to go back the next day and I took a GoPro. Mm. And it's really funny because I actually posted the video on Vmail, but it's uh, it's called the Jurassic Room. I call it Jurassic Room because the, the cave is so ancient in there in that room. It was so old. The stalactite and stalagmites had not only been old from the cave, but even older. There was something about it. And I'm filming as I'm trying to decide where to go with the exploratory reel. So it was just, I filmed raw. And it was really funny because, you know, I have the light on the helmet. So I keep, the GoPro keep going here, but I'm looking where to go. So you can see the light penning. Yeah. And, the cave. and it was like pure raw exploration of a room that has never been swum through before. And I've done many tunnels like that, but a room had such, that room had so, it's so unique. I it's call a, it the Jurassic Room. It's extraordinary because, you know, you think about how championed astronauts are, and you are you are that. You're the exact same thing. You're just going the other direction. <laughs> it's just so cool. And the only know, difference is we don't go through G, what is G4 mm-hmm. force? Mm-hmm. We don't do that. But the rest exactly the same and we don't have nasa waiting for us on land going is there anything not that nasa can do much once you're out there in space you're right space but yeah with this cave cave divers and you know, i have very good friends who are cave divers explorers as well um they're unique unique uh people but if you talk to any of them you will find the same analytical uh you know risk management uh, no bold kind of attitude divers. You'll mm-hmm. find very much solid people with a lot of preparation in them. All of them. I mean, many of them are called friends. It's just, it's it's a very unique mindset. Yeah. So people can um, come to you and study with you? They can come with me and dive with me. They can study under me like I teach courses I teach courses at professional level I teach the shark courses I teach the cave diving I do host some students but those are selected through the years mm-hmm. uh, but yeah people can come and, and do this it's also my job and then what I do is I use part of that uh, to like the cave diving exploration and mapping that I've done mm-hmm. is all benefited the Bahama National Trust and all the caves that I worked in are now under a conservation act and uh, that's all done like on my own time and my own money but then I make my money by working and taking cave divers or teaching cave course or anything like that so um and they that's can, how it works like you come and pay to be with the sharks and all of that and then there's a lot of that that goes into the shark conservation education things done uh on personal time and money without you know support of anything else that's that's how it works for me and they can find you through your website yes yes yeah, so the website is really really good is yeah very simple just make sure they don't put an h in christina c-r-i-s-t-i-n-a yeah. <laughs> it's very simple it's www.c-r-i-s-t-i-n-a-z-e-n-a-t-o christina zanato.com yes and i'll put links to that along with a lot of other stuff for this episode on heyhumanpodcast.com christina yeah. thank you for your time it's an honor to meet you really thank you sir Please send me the link so I can also promote your work. I will. Absolutely. I will. And uh, I wish you well. And next time I'm in the Bahamas, which, you know, whether maybe I'll get married someday. You don't need <laughs> to get married. Just come and visit. I know. I'm, I'm teasing him because you said that the first time you went there was because somebody got, you got a ticket on a plane that was empty. But, Just for um, honeymooners. It was full of honeymooners and me. Yes. Well, I, I, was like, I will cool. definitely. I to know the story about these two empty seats. <laughs> <laughs> it, it would be a delight to come out there. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Thank you too, Susan. Bye. Bye. Bye.